this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Mesh Tsunami podcast. This week, we're offering five conversations from episode three, our discussion on the new nozzle nomenclature. Plus, from the vault, a discussion from Easel 2023 about the nomenclature presentation, which was originally presented formally there. This conversation focuses on the impetus to revise the disease nomenclature in the first place. Maru Rinella describes what she terms an existential crisis for the field around a publication suggesting changing the name, but not in a holistic, thoroughly thought out kind of way. This led key global players to converge. Jeff Lazarus notes that stigma and several other processes and concepts came into the discussion at that point. Maru and Jeff agree that the participant recruitment process came in two phases. One where it was hard to get participants involved and a later point where it was hard to manage all the people who wanted to get into the exercise. Jeff felt the tipping point happened when people understood how the Delphi process would work and also why it was so important for this to succeed. Maru felt people had to grasp the implications of a consensus process, which Delphi is, on a final decision. As the conversation ends, Mike Patel and Nina Bonson Hall describe how they came to enroll in the first place. The nomenclature process was a multi-year activity with hundreds of participants and the potential to have a huge, really a huge footprint on this disease. This episode looks at how we've gotten here and what drove some of the key players in the activity. It contains an interesting piece of history, so just sit back, listen, learn, enjoy, and when you're done, join the dialogue in our LinkedIn discussion group. So we've talked about nomenclature a couple times on this podcast. I don't recall that we've done an episode um, specifically focused on it in a while, but um, it's been, I think, one of the most important things that's happened in the space in the last year. I tend to think of long processes as happening in three phases, which is, first of all, design or descriptive, which is you've got to want to do it, and then you got to figure out how you're going to do it, create the process, and then get to a point where you actually, uh, and I think you folks peaked this maybe um, by last May or June when it rolled out, well, or fall of 22, it rolled out tentatively. Last spring, it rolled out formally at the easel and then went on to roll out throughout the rest of the year. Second major presentation on it at the ASLD. And now we're kind of in the third phase, which is paying it off, which is what does everybody get from it? How's it working? And are you succeeding in the ways that you hope to? I just want to go back kind of one phase at a time for folks who have missed it or for folks who are on the outside and start with really kind of back when. I don't think we've ever sat and talked with anybody about exactly what the driver to do this was in the first place. So Roy, I think I'll, I'll turn to you since you were one of the two people with a steering wheel at that moment, even before Jeff showed up. Maru Rinella. Yeah. So that's uh, the hardest question to really answer, but I would just say, I would summarize it in saying that, you know, at that point, we felt like there was a bit of an existential crisis um, for the field. And that was mostly centered around the proposal of a, a redefinition of NAFLD at the time, which included uh, no boundaries for alcohol use and sort of de-emphasized the role of steatohepatitis. So the role of alcohol is very clearly impactful with respect to impacting the natural history of the disease. So that was a really big deal because it then alters the natural history data that we have, may alter response to therapeutics that are just really on the cusp of being approved and those in the pipeline and then perhaps impacting biomarker development. So that was the initial impetus for that. And then subsequent to that, there came a lot of discussion around uh, stigma and other uh, issues. So that's sort of what initially started it and then maybe I don't know if, if Jeff, you want to take it from there. Jeffrey Lazarus. Thanks. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that was really it. The issue of a new name and definition coming in. Some reports of patient advocates feeling that there was stigma with some of the terminology and in a sense that the field really needed to unite around a change that recognized that, you know, this is the hepatic manifestation of, of metabolic dysfunction and put metabolic dysfunction front and center into the name and have a definition that was more fit for purpose and not exclusionary or not, not defined by what it's not. Jeff or Maru, so that's the impetus. And then you say stigma came into it. What, what are some of the other things or as it evolved, what were some of the surprises? And then we'll go into the process. I don't know. Some of the surprises were, I guess, the, the, the difficulty that we had broadly involving people. I, at the beginning, I felt that it was people were a bit reluctant even to just be part of the process. And then later it became more like, well, why didn't you involve this person or that person? We, we really tried very hard to um, strike a balance between representing stakeholders and having it be a manageable number of people to work with closely um, because you do really need to converse, exchange ideas, uh, revise. You know, we we're trying to strike a balance and we went through many, you know, difficult conversations about, well, how do we represent? What's the appropriate proportion? Do you do it based on the amount of KOLs in a, in a different region? Do you do it based on publications and scientific contributions? Do you do it based on societal membership? 
membership size population, you know, didn't seem like the best way to do it. But anyway, Jeff, maybe you can come on. To me, that was one of the hardest things at the beginning, I think, uh, and ended up being something that was our biggest criticism, despite really trying to be representative. Yeah, it was hard to, to do the participant selection. Like Maru said, in the beginning, it was hard to get people to engage. And afterwards, it was a sort of like, why wasn't I involved as well? And I think people didn't really realize the momentum it would pick up the support that it would get. But um, we have a great outcome. I mean, we have the, you know, three of the largest societies fully endorsing it, um, 70, 80, I think over 100 now other societies endorsing it. And, um, and you know, the uptake, as I know we're going to talk about in a moment, um, has, been, has been very high. So question, and then, and then I want to ask M Mina and Mike about how they got engaged. But... Uh, so first it was hard getting people play. And then after that, it was really, if anything, more people wanted to be involved than you could necessarily absorb. What was the tipping point and why do you think it tipped? Going from not a lot of people wanting to be involved in the process, hard, being it hard to get people in the process to everybody wanting to be in the process. I think there was a realization that, you know, Maffold and particularly not necessarily the name, but at least the new definition was not going to work and that the field really had to come together. So in the beginning, you know, it's we should do this and what about this? And I also think, you know, and Maru, correct me if I'm wrong, but people didn't fully understand the Delphi process, the level of engagement, the fact that if you don't agree Agree, you can stay involved and we discuss and we revise and we had four rounds of this so there was a lot of discussion and it started to be the room you want to be in to help name and define the disease that you're working with and so suddenly more people wanted to engage but we were already in motion with those you know almost 300 people I think one of the hardest things conceptually for people was this concept of everybody would agree that you know consensus is important and of course you want to make decisions based on a consensus approach. But when it came down to it, you know, people had very strong feelings about one thing or another. And the critical thing that I think everybody understands is that we went into this with the commitment that we a priori decided what our thresholds were going to be. And we were committed to the outcome of that process. And we were not wedded or specifically tied to any particular outcome. I think that's important because some people will say, well, I don't like that. Well, I mean, if you would have asked me by myself, what would I have chosen? Probably wouldn't have been that necessarily, but it's not about that. It was about what the group came together and decided. And I think that was something that I think was hard for people to understand. Mina Bonsal. Yeah. I mean, I think that initially there was fear of being criticized for wanting to change something that we've kind of made a lot of progress in, in terms of epidemiologic studies, biomarkers, clinical trials. So there was this fear that we're going to go backwards. And when it was clear that we're not going backwards, we're actually going forwards. People want to be part of the snowball. You know, they wanted to now be part of it. There was clear momentum growing. It was clear that it was going to change. So you can either stand on the sidelines or be a part of it. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to be a part of it. Their feelings might have been hurt that they weren't asked to be a part of it before, but they probably could have rose in their hand. If they knew this was going on early on, they could have said, I really want to be a part of it. And I don't think that would have been thought of as like, no, you can't. If you were clearly somebody who was involved in the field, come on in. But then at a certain point, it's unwieldy. I mean, you can't have 500 people debating in a room. I think that Maru and team Jeff did the best they could with the situation. And the outcome has been something that's been very positive. And the uptake has been been great. So Mike, when were you invited to be part? And what do you recall about the process of enrolling yourself or becoming enrolled? Mike Battelle. Well, I received an invitation by email. It might have been Jeff. I accept it because I think it's important work. And I could be wrong, but I think there was two online and then there was one in person that I was a part of. There was one a year before, but I wasn't part of the early, early discussions of that. But it wasn't even a question. I accepted the same day I got the invitation. So I appreciate being included. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingmash.com. We'll be back next week to discuss what we know about mazel epidemiology today. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you next week on the podcast. Bye now. <laughs>